And Jesse, when I say ski bum, what does that make you think about? It makes me think about myself, hon. <laughs> no, but seriously. I'm Hannah Haberman. And I'm Jesse Bryant. And this is Yonder Lies, unpacking the myths of Jackson Hole. Our first four episodes have discussed topics central to this valley, whether it be the formation of Grand Teton National Park, indigenous people in the past and present, or most recently, conflicts over mountain goat management. Each of these stories have been unique models of myths themselves. And as we've recorded them, I'm reminded about one of the main reasons we wanted to make this podcast in the first place, to inform transient folks and people new to the area about the rich history of this place and about some of the pressing issues facing the valley today. Exactly. And I imagine that this episode will resonate with that transient crowd especially well, because I think it's fair to say that one of the main things, if not the main thing, that draws people to Jackson is recreation. And not just any old type of recreation, but skiing. In the winter, the town of Jackson turns into a ski town. There's really no way around it. Skiing is unavoidable here, and it is definitely the dominant culture. And not to say there aren't other things going on in town, but skiing is the most visible characteristic of this place these days, both in the winter and not. Oftentimes people will spend the entire summer working hard, working 40, 50, 60, 70 hour weeks in order to save up enough money to ski all winter. It's just the reality of how this town is these days. And nothing says skiing quite like Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, affectionately or perhaps just efficiently referred to by most as JHMR. Founded back in 1963, the resort itself has a long history, some parts of which are more visible than others. From the iconic Jackson Hole Air Force, a group of hard-charging skiers that pioneered what we now know as free skiing and explored sort of all of the backcountry terrain around Jackson Hole Mountain Resort and the Tetons, to the aerial tram, basically a giant box that can hold 100 people and rises over 4,000 vertical feet from the base area to the top of the mountain. All those things are true, but that also brings us to a major misconception about JHMR, that it exists in some sort of recreation bubble separate from everything else. For some people, tourists and townspeople alike, the resort is synonymous with this place. When some people think about Jackson, the town, they immediately think about Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. And for all the attention JHMR attracts to this place, related to skiing and snowboarding, it's important to note that Unlike other ski towns like Whistler, Aspen, and Vail, the resort is actually located just about 10 miles from the town of Jackson. And although it's somewhat isolated from the town of Jackson itself, relatively, JHMR doesn't exist in its own world of extreme mountain sports or recreation, unconnected to the people or the land around it. That's the myth we're hoping to tackle today. It dramatically impacts this entire valley, the town, the community, and the environment. It's the biggest seasonal employer in the valley. So its impacts go far beyond, well, skiing. And whether directly or indirectly, economically or culturally, whether for what some might call good and some might call bad, this place matters. And so we're gonna dive a little deeper into those impacts today, looking at them through two specific lenses. First, the impacts the resort has on the people. And second, the impacts the resort has on the land. We'll also spend some time today talking about Snow King, Jackson's more local ski resort, often referred to as, quote, the town hill. To be totally honest, when I first moved to Jackson, I actually thought that Snow King was JHMR for a couple of weeks, which is a bit embarrassing now, looking back. But but Snow King has also played and continues to play a really big role in shaping this community. What we want people to walk away from this episode with is this. No ski resort exists in a bubble, no matter how much the experience of skiing is sometimes marketed as such. And although recreation can seem inconsequential, it has serious effects on the way this place works and the way other similar mountain towns are impacted by ski recreation. We hope that, at the end of this episode, you walk away a little more curious about the ski industry and a little more aware of how the industry of skiing influences the life and the land of the communities around it. So whether you're a professional skier, someone who hasn't skied a day in their life, or somewhere in between, one thing is for sure, you cannot understand this place, Jackson, Wyoming, without understanding the ski industry. So let's dive in. As we mentioned at the top of this episode, 
JHMR is the largest employer in Teton County in the winter, according to a 2017 report put out by the Jackson Hole Chamber of Commerce. And it's the second largest year-round employer, right behind St. John's, the hospital here in Jackson. And in the summer, it's the fourth largest employer. But before we get in too deep, I think it's important to take a moment and ask, why does skiing and the ski industry even exist here in the first place? Okay, the first thing is geological. The Tetons, the east side of the Tetons in particular, are a normal fault that creates really steep, rocky, gnarly, as it's referred to, terrain that is just really conducive to extreme skiing, where it's at today. The second is meteorological. And so what happens as storms come in off of the Pacific Ocean is oftentimes they get funneled into the Snake River Plain and the moisture gets sort of trapped in the Central Valley of Idaho. And as it's moving east across the U.S., that moisture is condensing, 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 and then runs smack into the Tetons that rise 7,000 feet off of the plains. And as a result, you get a ton of snow and a ton of precipitation in the Tetons, which is different. So in addition to the terrain and all that condensing and condensing snow, there's also, how should I say it, kind of a, a lifestyle. In Jackson in particular, there's a really pervasive myth, the myth of the ski bum, which, when you start thinking about it, kind of also looks like the myth of the Western cowboy. And Jesse, when I say ski bum, what does that make you think about? It makes me think about myself, huh? <laughs> no, but seriously. Okay, yeah, someone, I mean, someone who's sort of carefree, there's a lack of responsibility as a part of it, and that, like, life is structured around funneling all your resources into maximizing the amount of skiing you can do. I would say the central hallmark of people who imbibe heavily in the myth of the ski bum is that life itself is structured to support skiing. In other words, you work in order to ski. You travel in order to ski. You make friends who also want to ski. And more recently, it seems your Instagram is filled of yourself and your friends skiing. There's a quote from this article online that says, responsibility is the mortal enemy of the ski bum. Wow, it's a strong quote. And when we really get down to it, what allows someone to forego responsibility in the way that this myth of the ski bum sort of seems to require? In a lot of cases, it's a kind of safety net that's a bit the opposite of the lifestyle the ski bum tries to embody that enables the lifestyle to begin with. It's having a sort of financial safety net. When you know you've got something to fall back on, it's way easier to have your life goal being just skiing as much as possible. The idea of the ski bum has been a bit different in the past. For instance, in previous decades, this financial safety net that we mentioned was often actually created by government programs, particularly the GI Bill, which gave young, mostly men, something to fall back on after serving in the wars. Now, it seems being a ski bum means, at least most visibly, having the safety net of a college degree and some sort of financial stability. And while that's certainly not the case across the board, there are people who are coasting and people who are scraping by, it seems like the financial bar is raising in terms of who gets to live a certain ski bum lifestyle. Yeah, Han, a bit earlier you mentioned the sort of mythologized cowboy, and I think that's so true that the mythologized ski bum is actually really similar. You know, a sort of outcast male out in the West, sort of making a life on his own, risking his body. And the funny thing about both the cowboy and the ski bum is that the most true thing about both is that the real people living those stories are, and were, more often than not, men from relatively supportive families. Taking all of that into consideration, I think it's just really important to remember that there are hundreds of people working at JHMR on any given day, helping make the machine run. They're teaching ski lessons for days in a row, shoveling snow, taking out the trash, cleaning toilets, driving shuttles, making your hot chocolate, they're cooking pizza and french fries, grooming the snow, mitigating avalanche risk, and there's the people who are making the marketing decisions, the spending decisions. What I mean to say is, it's one giant operation. And for a lot of people who work there, one of the big draws is getting a ski pass. The two can't just be separated into skier and server. Yeah, hey, that was me for years. 
I worked as a ski instructor. I didn't love it, but I did it because I wanted to ski. And that season pass is a sweet little bonus <laughs> in the mix. <laughs> and when you take a step back, it's kind of like, for what? For me to slide on snow? Like, what is skiing in the first place? What the hell are we doing? Feeling our bodies, enjoying life? What? What exactly is leisure to begin with? Whew, it's a tough question, and I don't know, one we could probably unpack for a while, and I bet a lot of people come to ski for pretty different reasons. But it's easy for anyone, whether you're visiting Jackson or a local who lives here and skis on the weekends or the weekdays, it's really easy to forget that real people are working day in and day out to prop up the massive tourist industry that is skiing, especially if you're not part of propping up that industry. People come from literally all over the world to vacation at JHMR and Snow King too, and people have to make that experience work. Yeah, and it's not just the people who are directly employed by the mountains. It's the people who drive the public buses, the babysitters who watch the kids as their parents go ski, the restaurants, the hotels, and baristas, and bartenders, and equipment rental stores, and equipment delivery people. It's the outdoor brands, the ski and snowboard brands, it's the athletes who try to make a living off competing in the ski world by putting their bodies at risk. At the end of the day, I'm left with a lot of questions. Do people feel like they're being treated fairly in these jobs? Are they making enough to make a living? Maybe support a family? To have somewhere livable to live? I mean, it probably depends on what job you have, too, but I think a lot about what kind of cultures are created by these work communities, especially when so many of these workers are seasonal transients, too. It definitely gets me thinking. Yeah, it gets me thinking, too. And so there's, there's a lot that we could talk about in terms of how a ski resort interacts with the people around it, but let's make a bit of a switch here and talk about how ski resorts and Jackson Hole in particular interact with the land, and more specifically with energy. Support for Yonder Lies comes from Think WY, Wyoming Humanities. Wyoming Humanities supports programs, grants, and initiatives in Teton County and across Wyoming that explore history, culture, and the human experience. To learn more about the Wyoming Humanities Council, visit thinkwy.org. Again, that's thinkwy.org. A few weeks ago, I was riding up one of the gondolas at the resort, and a few of the folks I was with in the gondola saw one of those new signs that the resort recently put up, the ones that say Jackson Hole operates 100% on green energy. It has a little picture of wind turbines on the bottom, and they started having this really serious conversation, wondering how the lifts ran when the wind wasn't blowing. Like, they genuinely thought that if the wind wasn't actively blowing, then all of the lifts wouldn't be able to move. They discussed that there must be some sort of backup energy source, and they seemed really perplexed by the whole issue. Wow, that's kind of wild. On one hand, it's pretty funny, but also totally understandable if you've never had the chance to learn about how wind energy actually works. <laughs> but also it makes me a little disheartened to realize that there's still such a lack of knowledge around green or alternative energy sources. I agree. But to be honest, when I thought about it, I realized I didn't exactly know how wind power could run a ski resort either. Like, I understand the basic concepts of renewable energy, but I didn't speak up during their conversation because... I didn't totally know how JHMR is using wind power as part of its operations. It made me think about the impact that this commitment from the resort could have on the land, though. Like, as we've discussed, JHMR is massive and has a pretty substantial footprint in this valley, so its commitment to green power has the potential to really influence perspectives on energy use and land here. It can. And it's an especially unique move given that so much of the economy of Wyoming is driven by coal, oil, and gas extraction. Annually, Wyoming coal mines produce about 40% of all the coal in the United States. I feel like we could make a whole podcast just on that. <laughs> I agree, but not to get sidetracked. What exactly is JHMR's commitment to renewable energy? In a press release they put out on September 17th, just before the beginning of the 2019-2020 ski season, 
The resort announced that it was immediately transitioning all of its electricity needs to green power. The renewable energy would account for the needs of its chairlifts, facilities, and base area operations. And when JHMR made the shift, according to a recent report from the National Ski Area Association titled Sustainability Standouts on an E-Mission, Wyoming Ski Resorts Greening the Grid, it brought the amount of purchased power in Teton County coming from a green power program up from 8.2% to 11.4%. I think it's also important to recognize that Snow King also switched to green power in November 2018, almost a year before JHMR did. It's important to note that Snow King is only powering its lifts with renewables, which accounts for about 50% of the resort's electricity needs. Unlike JHMR, Snow King is struggling to stay above the water financially and has been at the heart of some contested development as the resort tries its best to remain profitable and up and running. So maybe they're just trying to pinch some pennies a little more? (laughs) Can't forget about Snow King. Snow King has recently become a bit overshadowed by JHMR. There have been days when I've been there after a huge snowstorm and there's just kind of nobody there. It didn't used to always be that way though. Snow King was established way, way back in 1936 and was actually the first ski resort in all of Wyoming. Snow King was a big reason Jackson got its reputation as a ski town in the first place. The first lift there was established in 1946, which is wild to me, and before JHMR, Snow King was kind of the center of the ski world here. It continues to be, in some way. It hosts a lot of youth programs, racing, and it does serve a lot of locals. It's actually a pretty cool place, and I wish it got a little more recognition for what it does. But it is interesting and cool that they switched to green power, at least partially, before JHMR did. So to get back on track, what does this transition to green power actually look like for JHMR? You said the JHMR press release said they were making an immediate transition to renewables. Isn't that a transition that takes a bit of time, or energy even, to make happen? That's a good question. The transition relates to the resort's electrical needs, so it's really just a matter of where that electricity is coming from. Lower Valley Energy is the primary electric utility company in the greater Jackson area. It's also where the resorts get their power from, and they now have a renewable energy initiative where consumers can choose a so-called green power option. For this initiative, Lower Valley Energy sources some electricity from the Horse Butte Wind Farm, which is just outside of Idaho Falls. They also have two mini hydro facilities producing electricity, located in Bedford and Afton, down in Star Valley. The energy from these projects is certified as environmentally preferred power, a rating endorsed by national and northwestern region environmental organizations. So this energy from primarily the wind and also hydro facilities is put into the electrical grid, along with the energy that the company gets from coal burning power plants, and then anyone who gets their electricity from Lower Valley Energy pulls from that grid. It's kind of like a big bowl of soup. Wait, wait, wait. So the energy that's in the grid is sourced from both renewable sources like wind and hydro, but also from non-renewable sources like coal? then how can the resort claim it's running on renewable energy? I don't get it. You're right. There's actually no way for the resorts to know if the energy they're using comes directly from a wind farm. But what they are doing now is paying a higher cost for their electricity, a premium of just over one cent more per kilowatt hour of energy use. That comes with the guarantee from Lower Valley Energy that their money is going towards the investment and production of more renewable energy. So, the more people buy into the green power plan, the more Lower Valley Energy's grid comes from renewables. I mean, that's kind of encouraging, right? Like, they literally pay, what, 1.2 cents more per kilowatt hour of electricity? And they're playing their part in transitioning our regional communities to a more sustainable future? I think it's also pretty neat that the green power is coming from a source so close by. I think it can be pretty easy to get overwhelmed when trying to figure out how to play your part in the climate crisis. There's a lot of noise, there's so many options, so it's refreshing to see such a simple act that has the potential to have a pretty huge impact. Absolutely. And like we said earlier, this transition has a substantial impact on the land here. Because in the case of JHMR, the resort pays that slightly higher premium for their energy, And it's like the equivalent of 787 homes in the valley have transitioned to green power. And as for Snow King, which is notably a little smaller than JHMR, the switch is equivalent to about 40 homes in the valley transitioning to green power. 
Between those two resorts, that's a pretty huge impact. Support for Yonder Lies comes from Wildlife Expeditions of Teton Science Schools. For over 20 years, Wildlife Expeditions has been leading educational wildlife tours in Jackson Hole, Grand Teton, and Yellowstone National Parks. To see wildlife and support education, visit wildlifeexpeditions.org. Speaking of green power, we were lucky enough to talk to Phil Cameron, who's the executive director of Energy Conservation Works, a public joint powers board whose focus is to provide leadership, education, and implementation of energy conservation, efficiency, and sustainability in the Jackson community. He had some awesome perspectives on the green power option and the implications of JHMR and Snow Phil King's Cameron, switch. and I am the executive director of Energy Conservation Works. But with both Snow King and JHMR, those relationships started well before they got to this point of green power commitment. And frankly, both of them started with energy conservation projects. Um, so, you know, in, in the case of Snow King, we worked with Snow King, uh, the Jackson Hole Ski Club, the town of Jackson, almost four years ago, I want to say, four and a half years ago, uh, to help with some upgrades to the infrastructure on, on the hill. Uh, so they put in a much more efficient uh, lighting system that was better uh, for uh, the ski training program. Uh, it was better for energy consumption, and it also had beneficial attributes to the kind of dark sky, night sky environment and wildlife. So, it, you know, a relationship with Snow King started out of that, you know, three or four way partnership and ECW's funding of the Snow Bright lighting system on the hill. Uh, going to JHMR, the conversation with them, you know, I, I sat down the first time with JHMR in the spring of 2014 to talk about some conservation projects. Their interest in renewables, both on-site and off-site, and that was the first time we started discussing discussing the green power program and what a what a stroke that would be to get um, JHMR on, on on board there. And they instantly became a leader in in that sector in the ski industry. You know, the largest largest North American ski resort, to my knowledge, that has made that 100% green power commitment through their local utility. Very direct, and there all that energy is coming out of the Horse Butte Wind Farm, which directly connects to our local grid. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think they they were motivated by the opportunity to operate more efficiently, and then also to operate in a way that aligned with their values um, as organizations. Uh, and frankly, that we're seeing the ski industry pick up more and more. In my view, uh, in a way that is genuine, where you it's not just about the marketability. Sure, that's beneficial, uh, but it's going to become standard practice. And we want, it, we want it to get there to the point where, you know, if you're buying energy, you're choosing green power or that becomes the standard practice. And you look around you, whether you're a business owner or a homeowner, and you see the participation, you go, wait, why am I not doing this? I live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. This is the birthplace of conservation. This is, this is the least I can do. You know, yeah, I can switch out my light bulbs. Yeah, I can make my home more efficient. Yeah, I'm on green power. Mm. And we want it to, you know, I want to see it be the norm. And I think if there's a community in our region that has the capacity both kind of culturally and financially to be an emblem for the highest level of participation in the country, I think it's it's here. And so much of that has to do with getting people familiar with the program. And, you know, as an organization, we invest very heavily in communications around this green power program over the course of the past two years. And I think to circle back to your question, part of the, you know, the tail end of your question about how, what's the impact been. So in that time frame, we've increased the participation by number of accounts by about 50%, uh, but we've increased the participation by volume of energy by almost 100%. And so this is meaningful. You know, when we started, we were in single digits, you know, middle single digits of participation. And we're, we're around four and a half, four, four and a half percent participation. Um, we're pushing up to close to 11% right now, but there's no reason we shouldn't be at 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or hundred percent participation. Uh, and, you know, we want to create the problem where it becomes challenging to find more green power, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what was awesome about Lower Valley developing another relationship with the wind farm outside of Evanston. That was by virtue of people saying yes. You know, we try to make it easy so they can say yes to green power. I would just say that I hope anybody who's listening to this 
who wants to get involved, contact us. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of different ways that you can take that first step, and we can help you identify which one's the best fit for you. It was such a treat to talk to Phil, and I think he outlined something super important. Everyone needs to be taking steps to help mitigate climate change. Climate change is going to impact all of us, but particularly for folks in mountain towns, it's pretty clear that a warming climate goes directly against the interests of the ski industry. The logic is simple. Warmer winters means less snow. According to a 2017 report from the U.S. Department of Commerce, the outdoor recreation industry contributes $427.2 billion to the U.S. GDP and provides over 5.1 million jobs. So outdoor recreation is a substantial economic driver, and it's threatened by potentially shorter and warmer winters. More specifically, a 2018 report from a climate change advocacy group called Protect Our Winters found that a low snow year can cost the ski industry more than $1 billion and 17,400 jobs. Less snow means less visitors, which means less visitors for restaurants, hotels, and local businesses too, which also means less jobs for all the people who depend on the tourism economy to make their living. So, in addition to switching to 100% green power, JHMR is also a founding member of the Climate Challenge, a voluntary program that recognizes ski areas nationwide who are working to curb their impact on the environment. Participating resorts are required to report their carbon footprint, set goals for carbon reduction, implement at least one on-site carbon reduction project a year, and participate in advocacy efforts. But just like any environmental solution, the actions taken by ski resorts to curb their emissions is varied and consists of anything from major infrastructure changes or building renovations to encouraging carpooling. And JHMR has done a little bit of both. While it does heavily promote its most recent switch to renewable energy, it's also put a lot of effort into building the new park and ride facility over at Stilson and ensuring that the resort is easily accessible through free or cheap public transportation. You know, don't get me wrong, I'm really glad to hear about all the actions that the resort is taking to address climate change, especially because their business relies on having winter, right? But there just seems like there's a much bigger irony to the whole thing. What do you mean by that? Well, the climate challenge, which we mentioned earlier, has three ways a resort can categorize their emission. The first is direct emissions from like vehicles and snowmobiles. The second category is purchased electricity for chairlifts. And the third is indirect emissions, like those from skier travel to the resort. Very few resorts participating in the climate challenge report this really big third category of emissions, or if they do, their ability to decrease these emissions, they say, is minimal. So what that means is that people come from all over the planet, and even more so now with things like the Icon Pass, to ski at Jacksonville Mountain Resort. The Icon Pass, for those who aren't familiar, is a pass which bundles together a limited amount of days at a bunch of ski resorts for a relatively cheap cost. There's a couple like it. Right. But more and more ski resorts depend on people actually traveling there to ski, some from really far away. And this travel is a tremendous carbon footprint and a tremendous effect on the environment and therefore on the future of the winter. A greenhouse gas emissions report from 2018 found that ground transportation accounts for 64.4% of CO2 emissions in Jackson, while air travel and aviation is the second largest contributor to emissions at 17.4%. That includes both tourists and townspeople, which I think is important to remember. We can't just blame everything on the tourists. So you're saying that, sure, it's great that the resort has changed how they source their energy, but there's still this bigger irony because folks fly to here and from here, from all over the country to ski, in some ways negating the work that the resort is doing. Yeah, I wouldn't say negate, maybe, but it's a huge variable that's not addressed. But uh, just that this is a fundamental part of our conundrum, not just in the ski industry, but across our economy, right? Like companies, whether it's Walmart or JHMR, are always willing to change a little bit within reason. But what no one is willing to do is just stop consuming so much stuff. And for JHMR, the stuff being consumed is just skiing. As the resort is decreasing its emissions, more people are flying here to Jackson every year to ski. And I'm not saying I have a solution. Well, maybe maybe I am saying that. Like, we could just ski less. (sighs) I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. 
unfortunately, but I do think we should all consider how our actions impact the environment, and maybe, just maybe, we could think about making some changes about our behavior. And one more thing I think is important to add to the mix here. A 2016 article in Powder Magazine titled Campaign Donations Link Ski Industry Leaders to Climate Change Deniers found that many ski resort owners, trade groups, and ski industry leaders have actively supported congressmen and women responsible for blocking climate change legislation. None other than JHMR's owner, Jay Kemmerer, as well as former JHMR president, Jerry Bland, have been linked to politicians who've supported anti-climate change legislation. I also think it's important to know that the Kemmerer family is an old Wyoming coal family. They made their money in Wyoming's Powder River Basin coal mines before selling off the mines in the 1980s. They do a lot of philanthropy these days, but it is interesting that that's where their money came from. Oof, it's kind of a lot to unpack. And yeah, I think it's easy for folks on the left in particular to just blanketly pin coal mining Wyomingites as certain climate deniers. But as we know, it's complicated. You're right. They're putting their money into other things now, and investing in green power is a great first step, but it'd be awesome to see them go, I don't know, all in on assisting the state transition away from coal and towards more renewables, which is going to have to happen eventually anyway. It's just useful to point out the central conundrum here, simply that the ski industry is reliant on, first, that there is snow, and second, that there are people to ski on that snow. And for places like Jackson that are sort of in the middle of nowhere, keeping snow-based tourism alive means also an enormous emissions cost. Shifting behavior and economies is slow work, and these ironies aren't going to work themselves out overnight, but I do think it's important to simply identify them. Yeah, and it all starts with having the right information. So I guess the next time I overhear some confused people discussing how the gondola moves when there's no wind blowing. You're going to tell them it's a bunch of hamsters on a hamster wheel powering the backup generator? (laughs) No, I don't think I'll say that. I guess I'll try to do my part and share a little more about how this corner of Wyoming is working to support the development of renewable energy, and also how that process is complicated, and how we can all learn a little bit more about what's going on around us. We want to take a second to say thank you to Cole Herdman, our awesome intern who helped with some of the writing and research for this episode. Technical support comes from Jackson's community radio station, KHOL 89.1, and the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative. A big thanks to the Jackson Hole Historical Society for providing access to hours of archival audio. Special shout out to Doug Haberman for our theme music and Becca Hold Houston for our beautiful cover art. If you haven't already, please rate and subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. And if you'd like to support the show with a small monthly donation, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash yonder lies. That's P A T R E O N dot com backslash yonder lies.